So, thank you very much for having me, and um, it's, I must say, it's a real honour to be amongst the company of some great Ruskinians. I feel a bit of an imposter uh, here. Um, but I'm going to take you through a romp of a set of ideas that will be expanded in greater depth and detail following this presentation, I think, in the publication following this. Um, but it comes from, well, I'm calling this um, Ruskin Unleashed towards a revised political economy of art, or a joy forever and how to use art to change the world brackets and its price beyond the market which is a riff on the title of the exhibition that Poppy described that we held earlier in the year. The, the exhibition, this is the Whitworth uh, in all its revamped glory um, which I took on 18 months ago as the new director and I wanted to instil a new vision, a new direction for the gallery that was both radical but also revisiting its roots um, of it and its origins in the 19th century. So it was perfect having the 200th year of uh, John Ruskin so that we could just do a show which would espouse all these ideas. And it was called Joy Forever, Letters in Gold, um, for very particular reasons. Um, and the show itself was a sort of cacophony of ideas that you could extract from Ruskin's thinking either accurately or inaccurately at the same time. And we basically wrote the exhibition as a series of 10... Uh, lessons, and, uh, uh, what I called a, 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 a Ruskin lecture gone awry in ten parts. And so for this uh, presentation, I am uh, using the, the, the titles of those ten sections in order to expand on the ideas um, that were in play. So, number one, the political economy of art. Um, the story begins, really, with the great Art Treasures Exhibition of 1857 that Poppy described, still, I think, the largest gathering of paintings ever in the world, over 16,000 works of art in a, a temporary hangar um, in what is now Old Trafford. In a way, Manchester's riposte to the great um, exhibition of 1851 to show that Manchester could do things better and it was bigger and more powerful than those ruffians down in the south. And as part of that, of course, as again Poppy described, who better to come and speak the honorary lecture, if you like, at the Great Art Treasures Exhibition, but the greatest critic and historian of the day, John Ruskin. Uh, here is John Ruskin reenacting his lecture uh, this July at uh, Manchester Art Gallery, in the very same building where it was delivered in what was then the Athenaeum. Um, and the lecture really was a great surprise because they were thinking he was going to wax and wane on the, on the ideas of aesthetics and art and painting. But instead, he launches an attack on Manchester, the city he despised, because it was the pit of all evil in the world. It was industrialization at its grimmest. It was mercantile, cutthroat economics, the Manchester School of Economics, um, that was the, the center of all the world's ills. And this lecture, The Political Economy of Art, was designed to get into the heads of those Mancunian industrialists and merchants and to say, really, you've got it all wrong. Art, these great treasures, is not for your self-importance, your power, your delectation. Art is a tool, a process to be used in all walks of life. Economy is not fiscal economics. Economy is just good housekeeping of how we order society. Two, the handmade tale. At the center of Ruskin's thinking is the idea of the handmade, of working with your hands. This is the Coniston Mechanics Institute in the village of Coniston where Ruskin lived from 1872 onwards. <coughs> and Ruskin played a key role in rebuilding this Mechanics Institute um, as a kind of um, modern day art center plus uh, with a library, uh, art collection, uh, museological collection, bathhouse for the miners, catering kitchen, assembly hall, uh, billiard room and many other things. And this compendium of knowledge was what he created as his idea of what a museum might be along with other examples in Sheffield. But key to the Mechanics Institute, so Mechanics is of the hand, this was the national movement, the national institution, were wood carving classes for the miners and uh, the men in the village really and the women would produce lace, later known as Ruskin lace. And the point of this was at the heart of the arts and crafts movement, this is Ruskin's version, which is not the William Morris version, but is about making as a process which is political, which is about changing thinking, changing behavior, changing communality through the process of doing and learning through doing in the everyday. 
Interestingly, this story is a kind of the untold story of the history of art. Certainly when I was studying history of art, these ideas were not told. It was the formal development of art that mattered. But through Ruskin, we see the influence in Gandhi and his educational system for India in post-colonial um, South Asia. We see it in Frank Lloyd Wright's Taliesin communes of agriculture and art and architecture in the United States. We see it in Toynbee Hall in the East End of London with craft and making at the heart of a settlement to put bright, smart, educated people alongside the working class communities for mutual benefit and social change. We see it in the Bauhaus, a universal reappraisal of how we might do education with making at its heart and a curriculum which gives you a picture of the holistic education that Ruskin was espousing. <coughs> Filtering down into places like Dartington Hall, this is the headmaster's house at Dartington, where the Elmhurst family congregated an experiment in art, craft, design, and even agroforestry, and accidentally creating the world's first uh, battery chicken farm in this, what is now, what is now a ceramic studio on the site, uh, ironically. Three, the campaign against the EBAC. So whilst we learn through doing a making, there's something central missing from our education system, something being washed out. Art is losing traction. Creativity is losing traction. Humanities courses in universities are being reduced. At a community meeting two weeks ago at the Whitworth of members from the Mossside community looking back at the 1980s Mossside riots, the biggest voice from that community that came out from those who were there who were involved in the riots, fighting against racism, against Thatcherite policies, was to say, we don't hear the true story. We don't see the reality of why we've ended up like this. Our frustration is that we did not get the education, we did not get the support and the backing, the skills to know how to act. And that frustration boiled over. Why didn't they teach us about colonialism? Why didn't they teach us about economics? Why didn't they teach us about politics and the dark things that they don't teach us at school? Why did we learn about William the Bloody Conqueror, they said. This is the artist Daniel Ortiz working in Middlesbrough with um, single mothers seeking asylum in the UK. Remaking a book for children made in, 1980, in 1899 called An ABC for Baby Patriots. You can get the idea of what kind of education this was giving to British school children at that time. Remade by those mothers and their children as a fight back against the migration control system to tell a true story of how this country has worked, but also how it might work and how through visual literacy and visual agency, they might start to have a better stake in the world. This is something that the powerful already know. We're currently working with um, uh, an economist, Ishmael Turk in Manchester, who teaches art and aesthetics to his business school students. Apple get aesthetics and the power of the image. Germany, Audi, know how to not use, withhold the image in order to create an image, in order to create a market and create power in the world in a way that the British never did. <laughs> Four, on the uses and uselessness of drawing. Ruskin was, of course, a great craftsman and campaigned extensively for drawing, but this was not alone and for itself, as he would say. Art is a tool. Art, of course, is a way to see the world truthfully, but not just for truth, but in order to act ethically within it. This is the point of what Ruskin is saying. Students in dermatology at the Manchester Business School all study art as part of their curriculum because it is proven that they are better diagnosticians having visual literacy than those that do not. Forensic architecture, use freely available, available imagery online and in the media, scanning with algorithms to fight humanitarian cases around the world, fighting injustice, in this case, um, investigating the truth of a, a drone attack in Syria. 
Paolo Tavares in the Amazon jungle is working with indigenous tribes using aerial photography and working with botanists to demonstrate the original settlements have changed the flora and fauna of the rainforest <coughs> so that they can reclaim their land rights against industrial agro-business in the Amazon. Paintings in our collections and our national collections are being used by climate scientists to study the effects of climate change. Ice core samples are in effect a visual photograph in 3D of the story of our climate on our planet. This is a work by Trevor Paglin, an artist working in the digital frame who was showing us the way that algorithms work, the way that AI is now operating in the world. We are teaching computers and machines and robots to see the world, but without ethics. So why are we not teaching our children art and aesthetics combined? Five, Horse Falls Manchester Art Museum and the Manchester Settlement. Ruskin gave up on Manchester, but his disciple Thomas Horsfall did not. Don't worry, John, I can save Manchester. <laughs> Through the medium of the Manchester Art Museum and the Manchester Settlement, a museum based on Ruskinian principles to create visual literacy amongst that community, to create competence of the hand, of the eye, of the mind and the body, so that they may build a better society in that city, including rooms of nature study and model rooms to show you how to live well. Incidentally, a room by William Morris, which proved far too expensive for any resident of Manchester to produce. This was done in conversation with Jane Adams in Chicago, who set up the whole house settlement in uh, the west side of Chicago in a women-only settlement to work with migrant communities and children to do the very same thing, with an art gallery, with communal dining rooms, with lectures, with healthcare, with free law advice, a comprehensive, holistic model of how we might operate a community, but with art and art thinking aesthetics at its center. Six, arts and crafts gone wrong. We said in the exhibition, that maybe the ultimate manifestation of aesthetics and daily life combined in the way that perhaps Morris talked about really came to fruition, not in Liberty, where Morris ended up, but in Ikea. Ruskin said, form, art was form to achieve knowledge and was to apply grace to utility. IKEA doesn't quite fit the bill on those terms, but what could we do? What kind of art could we begin to produce that might start to bring these things together? It was in around 2012 on, uh, when I worked here. This is the farm of Lawson Park on the ridge above Ruskin's Brantwood in Coniston. I froze, oh, there we go. Where we met with the Cuban artist Tanya Baguera, an activist and artist, to write what we call the Criteria for Useful Art, or Arte Util, art as a tool. And from here on, we created an association to campaign to re-establish use value back within the arts, a convening of like-minded people from different countries who wanted to change the system, who wanted to promote artworks, art projects, and art-like activity that achieves social change. Doesn't just point at it, doesn't just talk about it, but actually does something about it. It makes change happen, working in the real. Not representation, but operation. And on the back of this, we created an archive, an online archive of hundreds of case studies, which would be an example to all about how we might start to make art work in broader society. Example here, number 62, the Astigates, Dorchester Projects. In Southside Chicago, repurposing and rechanneling the resources of the art world to rebuild housing, community centres, libraries, banks, so on and so forth. We run an education programme, an Escuelas of Arte Util, to teach the methodology of useful art in places such as San Francisco here, Mexico City last year, and now going to Sao Paulo next month. 
And this uh, is this week at the Chicago Architecture Biennial, a uh, pre presentation of the archive in Jane Addams' library at Hull House in the settlement, which Hull House will now use as a tool in its own right to enhance and support projects of social change and justice in the Chicago West Side. Seven, the case for social making. If we think about the role that making plays, making plays in society, it works on many scales. But I would argue that making in the very smallest way can teach you the competence, not the genius, just the competence to know how to change one thing to another, how to change a lump of clay to a vase, to change a society that's impoverished into a society that is wealthy. Case study 486 is uh, the mobile dairy unit, a project initiated by Fernando Garcia Dorian, artist who works in Asturias, who runs a shepherd school as an art project to repopulate rural northern Spain. This is uh, Fernando teaching a class in his version of uh, Canon Ronsley's Migratory Dairy School, a Ruskin idea enacted by Horsefall in the 1880s to teach, or well, to reteach rural communities how to make cheese around the Lake District. This is Fernando's updated cheese school in the Coniston Institute, taking raw milk from local farms, showing people the technique, the biology, the chemistry, the culture of cheese making. This is uh, the late, great Sally Beamish putting the cheese into Ruskin's ice house in Brantwood to mature the cheese for uh, a number of months and to produce what we then comically called Ruskin's blue veiny. No feminist jokes there. On the upscale, that process of transformation, of learning how to craft something and turn it into something new, is something we can apply on a city scale too. Case study 532, Granby Four Streets Regeneration in Liverpool. A community group in Toxteth whose area had been closed down, shut down, closed for demolition, managed decline being inflicted on them by Liverpool City Council, chose to make a stand, to form a community group, to bring in the artist architecture, design collective, assemble, to rebuild the broken down houses and use the rubble, use the dust, use the detritus of waste to make new forms of terrazzo, of woodwork, of printed textiles to refurbish the houses on their terms, to restake their claim in the community, to aestheticize their environment, not for their own delectation, but as recourse to power and agency in society. Number eight, 10 lectures to little housewives on the elements of crystallization, a book also known as The Ethics of Dust. Uh, we heard earlier about uh, Jorge's um, uh, project in Westminster and the connectivity that has with this uh, treatise, if you like, of Ruskin's book, which is perhaps around conservation, preservation, and the empowerment of women, you might say, and education. So a relevant project in this light might be one currently running with us at the Whitworth, which is called the Reno. The Moss Side group behind this nightclub in the 1980s that was the, the epicenter of the riots, it was their culture center. It was where it all went down. It was demolished at the end of the 1980s because it was a blight, because of regeneration, because of someone else enforcing their aesthetic regime on that neighborhood, wiping out its culture. Linda Brogan, the lead of this group, began an oral history project about the nightclub, which turned into an archaeological dig of the site, pulling out pint pots, ashtrays, bags of drugs, vinyl records, ripped jeans, everything else you might name. This now occupies for a whole year a central space in the Whitworth not just as an exhibition of the story and of the objects that were pulled from the site, but to ask the question, 
Who decides? Who makes culture? Who has the power? How can communities like this use the institution as a way to talk to power and to construct something that might become the new Reno? What kind of culture center can we build now on that site that works for Moss Side now next to the ruin, if you like, next to the church where they used to go? Nine, the allegory of good and bad government. A painting referred to in The Political Economy of Art by Ruskin, in which uh, he says that basically um, magnanimity is the greatest aspect of this painting, the greatest muse here in play. Something perhaps we are missing somewhat. This is the Brexit map of Britain. And this, I would argue, is the software for that catastrophe that has befalled itself, that has created separation, that has not allowed us to be generous of heart. This is a move away from the handmade. This is the demolition of the steelworks, heralding in a new tertiary digital economy, also heralding in an age of self-expression, individual expression, not communal societal expression. The result being people like this, who have had their aesthetic regime stripped away from them. They have had their agency taken away. Whilst those in power know how to use aesthetics really well. Vladimir Putin constructing his image, his chief advisor Sarkov trained in conceptual art, orchestrating politics with a very strong aesthetic acuity. The right populism we see now taking its cue from the Breitbart quote of politics is downstream from culture. They know that culture, that the way things look and feel and taste and touch comes first, everything else comes after that. 10, the road ahead. In 1873, John Ruskin rustled up some of his Oxford students to build a road between two villages, North and South Hinksy in Oxford. In a way, ridiculed at the time, but an absolute demonstration of Ruskin's chain of thought, that this was the complete and perfect education, showing his students what a good day's graft was, what it was like to be a labourer, what it was like to work with your hands and to create, but to do something purposeful and for societal gain but also one that should be a beautiful thing planted with ferns and primroses and everything else. The last image in the R exhibition, A Joy Forever, is a design by um, uh, uh, Takeshi Hayatsu, a Japanese architect, working with Grisdale Arts in the Lake District and our park staff to build a new Ruskin road, a new road in Whitworth Park in Manchester, the city he hated so much. A road handmade bricks handmade by neighbours, school children, university students, staff, whoever, you name it. Gardens, productive gardens, forageable spaces, orchards, an outdoor classroom, an outdoor cooking space, an outdoor restaurant, affordable housing, a park keeper's house. A comprehensive picture grown over time, built together with people to have a complete economy of good housekeeping and ecology in the park that points a way forward for how we might learn together through doing and making. It would also be a centre for our own natural cultural health service, using art for social good, using art in the processes of life, in the cut and thrust of politics. You might say, well, why is this art? Running a health service isn't art, is it? But that's partly because of the framework and the paradigm we have inherited from the last 200 years. The one that Ruskin was challenging. We understand things that are art and things that are not art. This is the binary set up by Immanuel Kant at the end of the 18th century. The prescription whose side effect was the creation of the perfect tool to create the art market and a version of art for the 1%. So what kind of art paradigm do we need now that will take us away from that world and re-engage with what was happening before this moment, at the beginning of the 19th century? 
with people like Ruskin, with people like Jane Addams, with people like John Dewey, who understood a holistic idea of how art should work embedded in the world. Not autonomous art, the, aut the opposite of autonomous is ecology. So I am proposing that we, we create an ecological framework for understanding how art works, what I call the coefficient of art. Let's not say whether something is art or not art, but how much art do we have here? Art as a process in time and space, a vector model like this one, which includes growing cabbages, making noodles, Tintoretto, and Frank Lloyd Wright. Everything in play in the world, a holistic model of art in which art plays a role in everything, from healthcare to politics to housing to keeping parks and running museums. I will end with the Manchester Art Gallery, another of the sites in play where we might try and enact these ideas to make the museum have purpose, like it always did, the way it was designed. And it was to my joy when I dug in the archives of the Manchester Art Gallery, formerly the Royal Manchester Institution, to find the original designs by Charles Barry. And because it was a blind submission architectural competition in 1823, he couldn't put his name on the cover. So he just put in Latin, nothing beautiful unless useful. Thank you.